and just to be kept away on the shelves or to be read only by scholars and imams. It is to be read every day. It is to be listened every day. People love it, so they memorize it. And they write it with beautiful calligraphy. They honor it. They beautify the recitation. They take it everywhere with them. One time, a friend of mine was going somewhere, so I said, I found in his, I saw that he was carrying the Quran in his eyes. I still remember this. He's from Boston. I said, you take the Quran everywhere? His response was, do you go anywhere without your eyes? So this is how people uh, have treated it. So this Quran has taken billions of people out of darkness into light from the injustice of man-made ways to the justice of Islam, the divine way, from the slavery of man to man to the slavery of one God, and from the narrow constraints of this world to the eternal expanse of the hereafter. It has changed our horizons. So this is the word of God that we have. And I think I would invite all of you to experience it. We read every kind of literature, fiction, at least read one good translation of the Quran and be your own judge. So with that, uh, I'm going to end. Uh, we do have some exhibits, and uh, I just wanted to show you what people have done with the Quran. And you can take a look at this. Uh, <clears throat> this is because we can take you to Istanbul, Turkey. This book contains some of the original manuscripts of the Quran, uh, including the one that Osman, uh, the fourth caliph, had uh, got Zaid bin Sabit to write. One of those is here. This is called the Osman thing. Of course, they have dug this is his personal, which they have now decorated and put a little border here to say what it is because it had no marks. And so these are here for you to look at. This is what it looked like. These are the originals. So you can take a look at this is how they used to write originally on parchment and, and, and uh, skins and bones and stones and because they didn't have paper. So these are some of the very original uh, manuscripts from the time of the Prophet Muhammad that are still around today. So you are free to look at this. And then, like I said, the Quran has been subjected to different ways in which people show their love for it. Calligraphy became the big thing, so everywhere it's in calligraphy because in Islam, Islamic art, there are no figures because of the idolatry that came and worship of figures and animals. It's only so they decorate now walls and uh, prayer places with calligraphy of the Quran. So here's one that was given to me. The way this person did it and now it's in print is these are some of the originals, but you can go through these hundreds of pages. What you will notice, the way he has arranged it, that every line starts with the same alphabet, the alif, in the entire Quran. You can go through the whole thing. So imagine the kind of work. Everyone will start with the same, same Quran, just the way they have. So people have done all kinds of wonderful things out of their love for the Qur'an. However, the Qur'an was not revealed. That having been said, was not revealed for this. It was revealed to lighten the hearts of the people, to give light to that, and to be practiced and to be lived. The Qur'an is interpreted by different people in different ways, but there is only one interpretation, which is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us. So sometimes people misconstrue and derive their own rulings from the Qur'an and lead to a lot of uh, trouble throughout the world by misinterpreting verses to their liking, using their own understanding of it, uh, which is skewed because you see the world with the glasses you have on. If you've got red glasses, everything looks red. And if you are seeing things in a narrow way, everything will look that way. So the Qur'an should be interpreted as the Prophet Muhammad taught us 
and his first generation. Explanation of the Quran in one place is from another place in the Quran or by the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, what we call the Hadith, and the early generations. That's how we truly interpret the Quran. So with that, we will end. And so I have this. And then, of course, I have my pocket edition, which is also the printed Quran, which is printed in the world's largest Quran printing uh, factory, which is in Medina, in Saudi Arabia, where we were. And they give these to us as free gifts. So you can have this in your pocket, and you can read it in. And of course, now what we have, as you can download it. <laughs> the idea is to read it, to understand the message of God, and to live it. Because truly, if people lived, if Muslims lived the Quran, you would have a very different opinion of what Islam and Muslims are. And what the negative opinions that some of you and many of the people in the world have correctly is because we do not follow out of our weaknesses what the Quran truly represents. So it's not a fault of what the Quran says, it's our fault, it's my bad. So we are going to take a short break uh, because our evening prayer is a little bit overdue and we'll be back in about five to ten minutes. If you want to write some questions or something, then I'll be happy to take those. The other thing we can also do, maybe they can take the refreshment break at this time. What do you think? Okay. We have a few questions, and I will try and answer them. There's some that are fairly similar. So there's a question, God often uses we to refer to God, why? A reference to the we in the Quran. The Quran repeatedly uses the word he for God. Isn't God not he or she or it, but some word needs to be used in any translation of the Qur'an. First, to address the we, uh, it is customary uh, whenever a king in this world, in any language, addresses the people, it's always in the plural. It doesn't say, I command, it's a, we command you. Because it is a plural, not of number, but of majesty. Because he is so great, so the word is used in plural, but it doesn't mean it's more than one. So I hope that's clear, okay? When the Queen of England will decree something, it will be we, it's she, okay, one. But because of, and it's in every language. In Arabic, it's the same. In Urdu, Hindi, in India, it's the same. We use the word hum, means we. So that's why the word we is used. So again, it's not a plural of number, but a plural of majesty. The next question is the gender word, he, she, it. Why is that? Does God have a gender? And you heard the verse that God is nothing like the likeness of anything. So there is no gender for God. So why is there a gender used? Because of the language. The Arabic language has only two genders, male and female. It has no neutral gender. Okay. So God chose the he as the male gender for himself. Okay. That's why that it is nothing to do with discrimination because he, it's not a he, it's not a male God or a female God. God does not have a gender. So I hope that's answered that. Uh, is there a difference between the Sunni and Shia Quran? There is only one Quran. Okay, so there is no separate Quran for the Shia or the Sunni or for anyone else. Approximately how long does it take to recite the Qur'an? If you recite it at uh, a proper pace, 
you could recite the Quran in about, in a day. If you recite it very fast, which is not recommended, you could recite it probably in eight hours. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, recommended that we not recite it in less than three days because you have to give due justice to it. And the Quran is not a competition of speed. It is because you should reflect and ponder on the meaning of it. Uh, so in the month of Ramadan, normally we recite the Quran in a whole month. So the Quran has been divided into 30 equal parts, just dividing it, say, 600 pages, 20 pages each. So the, the imam who's leading those prayers reads one thirtieth of the Quran every day so that by the end of the month of Ramadan, the entire Quran is covered. You could also ask, how long does it take to memorize the Quran? And that depends on the capacity of the people. First of all, there are some general rules. The younger the people, the quicker they memorize it. So we have six-year-olds who can memorize the whole, who have memorized the Quran. The average time to memorize the Quran for a serious seeker of, of memorization is about two to two and a half years. Okay. And most Muslim, almost every Muslim has memorized some verse, some chapters of the Quran, but we're talking about the entire Quran. Can you say more about jinns and angels and other unseen creatures? God tells us that he has created, thank you. He has created man from clay or water and mud or dust, whatever you want to call it. And he says we created angels from light. And he says we created jinn, which is the other creation, from smokeless fire. And Satan is from among them. In the Quran, he is not a, quote, fallen angel. He is not, he never was an angel. He was from the jinn. Because angels do not do anything other than obey God. They don't disobey. Number two, angels don't have choice. They're not a, a creation that was given a choice. Two creations were given choice, men, mankind, and jinn kind. And that's why, since he was among the jinn, he chose not to bow down to Adam. He says, no, I'm better. He is made from clay. I'm from fire. Okay. So that's about the jinn. So the jinns, there's a whole chapter of jinns in the Quran that they are a, a creation and nation like us. They reproduce. They are accountable. And the same thing, there will be judgment for them. So there are only two creations for which there is judgment because they have been given a free will and a free choice. Uh, <clears throat> Is the Sharia law, which is the divine law, based entirely on the Quran or, are, or have there been taken uh, additions? Is there another source of the Sharia? The majority of the Quran is from, um, the majority of the Sharia is from the Quran. Parts of the Sharia are from the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad himself, which means the meaning is from God, but they are his words. And a lot of that is an explanation and detailing of the Quran itself. Because the Quran, in many places, gives you principles, but not the details. So that comes from the prophetic tradition, what we call the hadith, what the Prophet Muhammad said. And that also has been rigorously preserved and verified, just like the Quran. And then there, are, there is room in the Sharia for new things that develop. So we have matters that are not clearly specified in the Quran or the prophetic tradition. Something new may develop. So there is flexibility in the Sharia, in the Quran. There are principles, so there is room for scholarly interpretation, what is called uh, ijtihad, which is uh, uh, analogical reasoning. For example, a situation may come up of uh, Artificial respirators. You say, where is this in the Quran? What should we do with somebody like this? Okay. So the scholars of Islam will take the, the Quranic principles and the prophetic teachings and give you an opinion that this is 
the opinion for this current contemporary issue, which is not directly addressed in the Quran. Okay? The first two cannot be rejected, but this, you have a choice. You can say, well, this is a human opinion. I will not accept it. So you have that choice. But then you better have a better grounding for it, not just what I like. Okay? So normally they will give you a ruling based on the Quran, but not directly. So there are other. There is also what is called ijma, which is a consensus of the scholars that they have all agreed on this, which is on something which is not directly addressed in the Quran. And so these are the secondary sources of the Sharia, but the primary source is the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What was the name of the mountain with the cave where the Prophet went? It is called Jabal Nur, which means Jabal means mountain, Nur means light. Now, was it named that before? Probably not. Okay, it was one of the mountains that surround Mecca. But because revelation, which is light, came down first there, the people have named it, I believe, Jabal Nur. Nur can be spent as J-A-B-A-L, Jabal, which is the word in Arabic for mountain. And Nur is spelled N-O-O-R or N-U-R, which is light. Like you have the Queen Nur and you know so and so. And that's a common name among the Muslims. Now we come to uh, another question which says, where is paradise located? This is a matter of the unseen. Okay. Paradise is not on earth, no matter how wonderful we try and make it. God has created paradise and hell beyond the known universe. So it's outside of this, because the known universe is slated for destruction just like it was created. Whereas those two places are eternal. So it is beyond this universe. Now how can we explain where it is? We don't know because it's beyond that. Okay. Um, just like God is beyond time and space. He's not bound by time and space. Okay. Beyond these three or four dimensions that we have. Now we have some questions that are related, and I'll read the questions uh, together, and then we'll try and uh, go through them. Islam is known as a religion of peace. Why is there so much hatred from Muslims towards all others? What do you think Muhammad, peace be upon him, would teach his followers who want to kill people who are critical of the Qur'an? So Islam is a religion of peace because the word Islam itself comes from Salam or Salama which is peace. Are Muslims allowed to kill anyone? The answer is absolutely not except if you are in a state of war. And I could have put some verses of the Quran up there where I'll just quote some of them. God says that anyone who kills without a reason, and the reason is war, or a just reason, or as a, as a prescribed punishment, because there is capital punishment in Islam. If he kills a person unjustly, it is like he has killed all of mankind. And therefore, and there is a verse in the Quran which says, anyone who kills, he is deprived from the mercy of God. For him, there is a painful punishment. God will not address him. He will not talk to him and will show no mercy to him. Okay. Even in matters of war, there are many verses. It says, fight those who fight you. It's a war of defense. And it goes on to say, God loves not the starters of wars. So do not be the one to start, initiate. There are verses which say, if two parties are fighting each other, make peace between them. And if one of them resists that peace, then you fight against them. So there is plenty of, 
of, of indications and direct rulings, the greatest crime or sin in Islam for the rights of God is to assign a partner to him. And the greatest crime in Islam or sin against other human, against creation is to take a life. The first thing on the Day of Judgment that God will ask about rights of others is if you have killed someone. Okay. So that's where that is. Now, <clears throat> Islam does not teach hatred to anyone. Okay. I'll give you an example of what the Prophet Muhammad went through similar to what Jesus, peace be upon him, went through. They were persecuting him. They killed his early followers. Uh, they ridiculed him. They put out a uh, wanted, you know, dead or alive on him, wanted him killed. They uh, drove him out and sort of put, put him in a valley for three years with his whole family where they had nothing to eat. Finally, they, they, when they decided to murder him, God asked him to move to a place called Medina. Thereafter, they went there and they fought three battles with him. Okay. After all of that, finally, as God's uh, will comes to pass in the end, Prophet Muhammad's supporters grew so many that they came back to Mecca, which had become the center of idolatry, which is called Fatah Mecca, or opening of Mecca, guess what happened? When his enemies saw that and saw the, how many people there were coming, uh, they surrendered. There was no bloodshed. So what was their fear? They thought that he would come and he would slaughter everybody because of what they had done to the Muslims. And when he came, he said, anyone who stays within their their homes and closes their door. In other words, shows no hostility to us, is safe. Anyone who was in the house of Abu Sufyan, who was the leader, is safe. And he, in other words, there was not a single person who was killed in revenge. Okay. There was a man who had killed in one of the battles by ambushing the beloved uncle of the prophet by the name of Hamza. And even he came uh, he ran away when they conquered, when Mecca was opened. It was without a war because he was afraid for himself. Then one day, the Prophet Muhammad had gone back to Medina. A person came with his face wrapped up and came right in front of him and said, I bear witness that, and there was a death sentence on him for what he had done. He had killed uh, Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet, opened his chest, taken out his liver and chewed it. Okay, this is the brutality and, and, and that was uh, done by this man. He suddenly came, he said, I bear witness there is no one worthy of worship except one God, Allah, and I bear witness that you are his messenger. In other words, he accepted Islam. After saying this, he unwrapped his face so people could see him, and right away the companions of the Prophet Muhammad saw, oh, this is Wahshi, that was his name. They started drawing their swords that we are going to behead him. The Prophet said no. He's a Muslim. Then he said, come and tell me how you killed my uncle because he was so brave, nobody could have killed him. He said that there was no way I could kill him except from behind, so I, when I saw him, I, I put my spear through him and I did this, this, this. And the Prophet Muhammad became teary-eyed. After that, he said to, to Wahshi, I want you to, whenever you are in my company, not sit in front of me. So they, he was asked why. He said, because in a weak moment, when I see his, you remind me of my uncle, and in a weak moment, I may do a prayer against you, and God would punish you. So that was his mercy. Okay. He did not take revenge, personal revenge, on anyone. He fought many battles that people came and fought against him. There was not a single person that was killed by the Prophet Muhammad himself. In fact, in one of the battles of Ahad, a sword hit him on the head. There was a gash here. It broke his tooth, yet he killed no one. Okay. He gave no order to kill anyone. Now, somebody who knows history might ask some questions about some special situations, and we have details of those. So, 
he would not uh, approve of anybody killing people. And God does not approve it. And the Quran doesn't approve it. What is happening in the world is a geopolitical reality. And without saying that this is justifiable, we have to understand that people go through all kinds of difficulties. Sometimes when they are desperate, they do desperate things. Okay. So somebody who say Palestinians are terrorists. Well, go into the Palestinian camps and see what they have been through for the last 60, 70 years. Go, if you say the Chechens are terrorists, see what Stalin and thereafter they have done to, they have taken millions of people and butchered them and killed them and what they are up against. So people when they, Islam is not a pacifist religion either, okay? If you are being persecuted, okay, you have to defend yourself. Now, sometimes people go beyond that. Islam forbids attacking non-combatants. It forbids killing women and children. It forbids destroying animals, property, trees, farms. That's in the Sharia. Fight only those who fight against you. And if that all the Quran says, and if they extend a hand of peace, stop. So that's what I can say. Now, there are some Muslims in the world that are doing terrible things, and we know that. May God guide them, that's all I can say. And Islam doesn't teach hatred. Hatred comes from experience of people with each other. And there are hatred, I mean, there is hatred here. You go on some blog sites, you, you see my name there and see, never wronged anybody. People, when you have the unknown, it brings fear, fear as a, a defense of the fear is hatred, is you, you sort of demonize somebody so you can kill them and have, you know, in those days it used to be swords, now it's very easy, you press, you know, control F, gone. Nation is gone, okay? So, none of that is justified. No matter whether somebody does it with a turban on and a beard or somebody does it in a tuxedo. Killing people is the same. Okay. One day I did an analysis of how many people have been killed in the last 50 years majority of them have been Muslims, if you count the wars. From Chechnya, to Bosnia, to Kosovo, to Iraq, to Afghanistan. You look across the globe. 90% of everybody that's been killed has been Muslims. And if you, Muslims are the terrorists, they are the ones who are killing people. No, they are the ones who are getting killed most places. Uh, so we have to look at the whole picture. And like I said, in no way am I justifying the actions of those Muslims who do wrong things, okay? We condemn those, we, you know, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, it's non-combatant, these are civilians, they are not at war, women and There are Muslims who were killed in that. We have a list of Muslims who were killed in that. So that's, you know, somebody's, messed up understanding. So that, I think, answers most of the questions. If there are any other questions that people have, uh, I will, yes. Dimmies, when Muslims, uh, the Muslim caliphate spread, there were non-Muslims who were living in those areas minorities who were not uh, Muslims. And as Islam permits freedom of faith, they didn't have to convert. They kept their churches, and as you know, the, ch the ch church of nativity, the key of that has always been with the Muslim, okay? Anytime people were persecuted, the Jews particularly in Europe, where did they go? They went to the Moorish Islamic Spain. That's where they found refuge, okay? so. Mus the Islamic State guaranteed the safety of non-Muslims, which were called dhimmis. Dhimma comes from responsibility, okay? What was the guarantee? That you did not, the Muslims, 
pay what is called zakat to finance different things, to support the poor and things like that. So if you're living in that, you didn't have to pay that as a non-Muslim, but for the protection, for the, for, for, for the defense, they paid a certain amount of tax, if you want to call it the